uh, Shanagad, uh, Nola Dagodoa, Tashko Agwadetian, uh, Kolonai, Digi Loshan, Nole Gehi. Um, hello everyone, my name is Nola. Um, I'm 20. I'm a tour guide. Um, I'm an oral historian. Um, I do, um, we do lectures, we do programming like dances, um, just a variety of things. We meet with a lot of schools. I'm just mostly educating um, the public is what I do mostly. I'm also a finger weaver, um, which is one of um, just a Cherokee art form that we've had around for thousands of years. Um, so I'm still carrying it on. Um, yat esh na feather and shit to the chin and slump in bushes chin. Um, shio, the name of the Dalit Dagoda. Uh, so hello, my name is Chanel, um, Chanel Feather. I'm the education uh, program manager at the Museum of the Cherokee Indians in Cherokee, North Carolina. And I introduced myself in my Navajo language, in the Dene language, which is my mother's language. And indigenous people are matrilineal. So I always introduce myself in my mother's language because um, to the creator, I'm a Dene woman. And um, Dene is what we call ourselves. Um, my dad is Eastern Band Cherokee from right over the mountain here. And um, I grew up in Cherokee, North Carolina. And I also introduced my clans. So my clans are, um, my first clan is Bitterwater, the Dene people, and my second clan is Deer Clan um, of the Cherokee people, my dad's clan. I grew up on the top of Sokol Mountain. So um, <clears throat> it's, called, it's a little community called Rough Branch. And so like when you go to my house, my childhood home, like you go in, you look around, then you look out the window, and it literally looks like you're in a tree house. Um, just so many, like, I, I can remember growing up, like, and hearing the water, you know, like, um, behind my house, there's a little waterfall that I fell off of once when I was younger, um, exploring. And then also, um, I could hear bears, a lot of, like, there's, I think there was a family of bears I could hear. I, th I literally think one night I heard them, like, scratching, um, the back of my house. Um, and like, whenever I, and, and, and um crickets and I, I did not realize how much you know you take for granted the things that you have at your disposal all the time right so I didn't realize that until I left for indigenous people that sense of place I, I think for any people that sense of place is important like where did where do you originate from and like whenever we like talk about like I think that's one of the biggest things in you know America um, so many people are looking for their sense of place like, where is my origin, right? And a lot of it is because the origin isn't, for majority of the people, isn't here. <laughs> Everyone has been displaced. Um, and, you know, indigenous people within our own indigenous lands, but non-indigenous people within different continents. Like, where is that? Whenever you feel that, you're, like, you're always searching for home. Um, you're always searching for a piece of yourself. And, and it didn't hit me until that moment when I was looking in these mountains and I was like, man, this is the, it's beautiful. And here I was for 21 years of my life, like just existing in this place and never even cared. <laughs> I was like, took it all for granted. Um, and it didn't hit me until then. And so we teach that like sense of place. You know, indigenous people have this just deep understanding of what balance is and how balance works in this world. Um, and that's how we were, we're, that's why we're stewarded of this land, because we understand that, you know, we live off of this land. So it makes sense that it's our job to take care of it. Because we're the ones, you know, the trees give us oxygen, you know, the sunlight, the water, all these different things, you know, these things are, are given to us the least that we can do is give back, you know, take care of it, make sure it's, we're honoring that, that land the same way that it needs to be, that it's been taken care of for thousands of years. Um, and that balance falls into place, especially in like our daily lives. You know, we're, we were a matrilineal society, but that like, and we held women to a higher regard, but there was a balance there too. There was a balance and understanding between men and women. You know, the roles of women and the roles of men, there was a balance there. Um, and as indigenous people, the more you learn, the more you talk to them, you know, you'll hear it, it'll come up and you start recognizing that balance, you'll have a, a more understanding of how we think um, and how we move and, you know, why we do things the way we do, you know, why there's an exchange of food every single time that, you know, you come and you meet somebody or you exchange gifts. Um, so there's just a balance there. So Tohi in our language uh, means, um, there's three meanings to Tohi, which is 
the first is balance. Like, how do we, um, whenever we're talking about, you know, healing and like generational healing, you know, I, I always, my, my team, I probably get so annoyed um, because I always talk about, oh, generational trauma, generational resistance. Like, why, why does Chanel always have to put generational or intergenerational before every word that she says? Um, so, like, generational healing. Um, and that comes to this, you know, the, that point of existing now is working on that generational healing. And um, that comes with achieve, trying to understanding how do we move forward closer to Tohi. Tohi is that balance. Um, and Tohi for me is like holistic healing. So like physical, emotional, um, mental and um, spiritual health, um, all of those four things, like you have to have in balance and it's in that center, which is Tohi. And then, so that's one thing is balance Tohi. The other thing that we called Tohi was when we watched the water. And when we, when we would watch the water, if it wasn't going too fast or if it wasn't going, if it wasn't flowing too slow or if it was just real consistent and calm, that's Tohi. And so we learned like, and that's how we should live our lives. So we learned that, like we learned a lot of things from nature. So when we talk about that connection to land and we're looking at, you know, that um, that's a lesson right there. Um, like how that, how, you, how the water flows, like we'd watch the water, but oh, why is it going so fast? Something's about to happen. Why is it? Why is it so low? Why is it slow? You know, and if it's just tohi, if it's just consistent, it's like that's where we. That's good. That's where we have to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and to add a little more to that, like uh, the land is our original teachers. You know, when we talk about our oral history, you know, our stories going back thousands, and thousands of years. A lot of our original stories they start and begin with the animals and the plants, um, and we learn we learn so many different things from them, and we get so much from them. Um, so it's important that, you know, that we do continue taking care of the land. It's important that we do talk about climate change and, um, you know, how are we going to be better stewards? How are we going to be good um, elders? How are we going to how are we going to be good ancestors? It's important that we leave it better than how we found it. My name is, the full name is Brandon Chris Toss, and it's, uh, the last name is T-H-E-I-S. Um, I started out as, uh, out of high school as a plastics engineer. 
uh, worked in plastics for uh, a long time. Switched over to um, IT and uh, stayed in IT for about 18 years. And then at the end of that, I just kind of got burnt out and um, took a five year sabbatical and then decided I wanted to be a farmer when I grew up. Tech really drove me away from it because I was inside so often. Um, but we never miss a chance to go camping. We're always out there. Um, I take the kids camping every year. We go on top of the Naked Mountain. Um, and stay up there, especially during July. There's a, it's 4,400 feet and change up there, so we get a really good 20 degree temperature drop. And in July, boy, that feels good. That feels great. Um, there's really no challenges. I, mostly the job. Um, tech jobs, they just keep you inside. Uh, I mean, I spent 18 years at a desk. Um, I get to look out a window, and that's it. Um, so I stuck with watching weather, uh, radars and different things. Um, and then every chance we got, we'd go camping. But I was working 18 hour days, uh, most every day. Um, and by the time I got home, I had no energy left to do, to go <laughs> anywhere. I just wanted to lay down and go to sleep. And it finally, I guess, got to me enough, which is why I said, okay, yeah, we're going back to this. Um, I had never had farming in my radar. I just never thought about it. It was never a thing for me. Gardening, sure. Um, but then it's like, okay, fine. Let's just go away from the tech altogether. I want. I don't want in. The, I don't want in a building. I want to be outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a very, very positive change. Very positive change. Um, I get to hear birds again early in the morning. Uh, I get if I get up early enough, I, all the deer come by. I run them off, but <laughs> I like to see them come by. So to start this place, I had I did quite a bit of research trying to find this model and what would actually work on this land base. Now this land base is horrible. It's a technical nightmare to do. So I started working with conservation agencies and uh, we're starting to get funds and stuff flowing in here to fix things that are really cost prohibitive for me. Um, because it involves the state, it involves federal government and local, local authorities to get in here and actually fix the line of it. And that's getting ready to happen next year. Um, just to kind of improve the, the land quality itself. I knew I wanted to do organic. It's just, it was just gonna be good for it. Uh, we need to bring, the, before it was here, I put most of these trees in. Um, there was nothing holding the bank. The people that were here before kept mowing the bank and the creek would wander and it just washed all the soil out and it left nothing but rocks. They tried to put telephone poles and concrete, and rebar and all this stuff in it didn't work. So I took all this stuff out. We put, uh, we went back with what's supposed to be here. Willow trees, red buds, um, some uh, oaks. And we've got, uh, let's see what else, maples. And there were things to kind of hold. The willows along the creek, let the grass grow up along it to hold everything in place. It's the way nature wants to do it. So work with it, not against it. I grew up uh, not far from here, a town called Irwin. Um, and that's where I really learned about land. My father was a, a, an old school conservationist. And his saying was, you go in the mountains, you don't leave a trace at the very minimum. No one should know you were up there. No one should, you should never be able to tell you were there. I saw that because he was a big hunter. Back then, that's what everybody did. When you hunt, animals can smell us from four miles away. It's the same way as we smell a skunk. We can tell when one's went off from a mile away. Animals, that's the way they smell us. So, all their teachings of us, you don't leave trash. You don't, you, you don't mess with anything. You don't cut trees down. You don't do anything. If you need to build a fire, you use what fluid is already laying around. It's already dead. Don't mess with any of this. These mountains were a backyard. And, um, we grew up in them, we played in them, uh, we worked in them, a lot of us logged a bit. Uh, Help from local loggers and foresters and stuff. Uh, a lot of my brothers worked for Forest Service for a while. After, after high school, they went out and worked for Forest Service, clearing trails and paths and different things. Um, it's always been a part of us. We, we grew up in these mountains, so it's just always been there. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have a special reverence for it. When we were growing up, there was a bunch of us in our little neighborhood. 
and we were probably 15, 16, 17. All of us young boys bored, nothing to do. So we would always go back up the mountains. And that's where we did. We camped all the time. And then one day, I got this bright idea. We were all up there and I'm sitting around talking. And we have a laurel tree. And what a laurel tree is, a, it's a wild rhododendron. They get big, they get really big. But they create a canopy of about 20 feet tall. And I didn't weigh 100 pounds soaking wet. So I started climbing up. We always climb trees. So I climbed up on top of them, started bouncing around. I thought, hey, let's try this. There was a, a birch tree that come up above them. So I shimmied up the birch tree about 20 feet, jumped out of it, and landed on the top of the canopy. And that was great fun. Um, so all of us started doing it. So we came up with this little sport that we call laurel climbing. We go climb up in the tops of them and we jump from tree to tree to tree to tree for miles. We would go for miles. And if you hit the ground, you're out. Let it go. That's, yeah, we used to do that all the time up there. With um, grapevines, there's wild grapevines up through there. A lot of us got hurt on them, <laughs> uh, but they were fun. We would have 100 foot drop offs, we'd swing out over them. Grapevines. I've been gardening since I was eight years old. Um, my great aunt is the one that taught me how to do organic to begin with. Um, she was considered a health nut. There was no such word as organic back then. And she wouldn't eat anything that had any kind of spray or anything on it. And uh, she showed me how to grow this stuff like that. And it tasted better. It tasted so much better. Oh, it's so good. Mm -hmm. um, these varieties like of tomatoes and potatoes and stuff that you're doing now. They bear no resemblance to what a real one is. They bear no resemblance. Uh, these tomatoes you get at the store are cardboard dressed up as a tomato. They just taste awful. I did 160 varieties of tomatoes this year. I had them from all over the world, from every continent except Antarctica and Greenland. Wow, was that good. Yeah. Was that so good. I had all kinds of people jump on the CSA just for tomatoes. That's all they wanted, just for tomatoes. We started seeing temperature fluctuations back uh, it used to be um, when I was in grade school they would shut school down in Irwin and probably right around in through here as well starting in December and it would not open back up until mid-February because the roads were wiped out there and it would keep snowing and snowing and snowing every week we'd have six inches of snow that stopped by the time I was 13 and it has not snowed since then like that ever. We've had two big snowstorms, 93 and 96. Um, and since then, we've not had anything. If you ask anyone my age, anyone here that's been here, does it snow like it used to? The answer is no. It has gone away. A three inch snow around here, people panic. It used to be three inches, no one would even pay attention to. Um, it wouldn't even matter. We've seen the effects of climate change. I don't need to watch it anywhere. I've seen it all my life. I've watched it go down over the last 40 years, which is where the really the largest amount of empirical data lays is within that 40 year period. It's what I've been watching. I've always been an avid weather enthusiast. I watch it all the time. It was one of my first jobs I ever wanted to do was be a meteorologist. The trees are, for instance, this year, I'll give you an example. Our ginkgo tree over here, it will hold its leaves until the first frost and it drops them all at once. This year, it started over a month ago, barely dropping leaves. And then it slowly dropped them all down and after the first frost, it still held them. And it's not just with that, that was just a weird, a weird side effect we've had. All the trees are changing when they drop their leaves. They're not on time, they're always a little off. Um, so yeah, I've kind of always followed it um, because it ties in so much to uh, everything else. I mean, it's, it, it's just tied into everything. Um, and then when you walk out your front door and see it because you grew up here, you've watched this all your life and you're thinking, okay, all these people that don't believe it, yeah, they haven't seen what I've seen. They don't remember and they don't care. So. Uh, when I was younger, we had a lot more species variety, we'll just call it that. Um, there were plenty of deer, plenty of turkey, um, a lot of fox, uh, there weren't a coyote here, 
Uh, we definitely did not have the insect volume we have now. That is really exploded. I'd say over the last, since over the last seven years, I would say it has really exploded. Tell me your name. My name is Clay Blazer. Alrighty. Uh, can you tell me uh, where you live and what do you do for a living? Um, I live in Parrotsville, Tennessee, which is about between Newport and Greenville. And then I'm a teacher full time and then I am a part time farmer. All right, awesome. If you can be such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how long have you lived in Parrotsville? I'm 43 in my whole life. Pretty much, other than I, whenever I was in college um, from what, 19 to 22 or so, I was at, lived in Knoxville at the University of Tennessee, but then the rest of that time I've lived on my farm. It's very interesting, I think, the things that you would look at because I, I have learned as an adult, and especially with where I'm at, I think growing up on a farm gives you a lot of a unique perspective of life that you don't have when you don't live on a farm. Um, obviously, number one, hard work. I mean, that's just very, very important to me. I mean, and that's something that, again, you, you kind of can't live on a farm without working hard. I don't think um, I'm very much like from a personality standpoint, like I know I've worked with people and I have, and I mean, a lot of people who are really kind of very rigid and like, you know, they have a, a schedule and they don't deviate from that and like any time and like and they plan things out you know to the nth degree and then when something goes wrong like I mean it totally throws them into a tailspin you kind of can't be that person when you're a farmer because like natural disaster I mean you you can't let things kind of work you up in other words you definitely have to adapt and so I think that you know there's a lot of good life skills that, that I've just kind of picked up from being on a farmer. You know, I think hard work is a good skill. I think adaptability is a great skill. I mean, now I have the ways that I want things to be done and you know, like, you know, my day or whatever else to go. But um, I, my mom and I, we're still both, we still both actively farm. And if we make a plan, then you that, that I, that's when the cows get out. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been on my way somewhere and I've had to turn around, go change my clothes, you know, d get whatever particular piece of work had, had to happen. Or you've got a cow that's having trouble having a calf. I mean, just some kind of a problem. So life's not neat and tidy and it's really hard to kind of plan things out. 
But I also think as a result of that, like I don't get overwhelmed very easily um, just because there's always, you know, there's always 50,000 things to do on a farm. Like you never get caught up with your work. I know you're on a farm and you never get your work caught. Like there is no such thing as being caught up with your work. I mean, because as soon as you get done with one, I mean, there's always a fence that could be repaired. There's always something you could be doing. So I think that whole, that just makes you, you know, just again, much more adaptable. So, I mean, I think that that, um, that's something I think about. Um, my sisters would say they learned to cuss in the tobacco patch, and I would kind of agree. I mean, you know, because you do. I mean, it, it, at times it was hard. You know, it's really, really hard work. It's hot work mm-hmm. um, at times, you know. But at the same point in time, like, they didn't enjoy it. But now I've always enjoyed it. Like, I mean, even from whenever I was younger, um, I've always enjoyed working on the farm and just, you know, doing a variety of things like that. I've always enjoyed like my farm background Mm -hmm. and I think that that is just something that is um, like my dad, I think that that's it. We have always been conservationists. um, So we do a lot of practices that I know that other people and I see other farmers when they don't do it and I just kind of cringe. I mean, so I mean like a lot of our conservation practices that we will use. I, um, I wish we could get more people to do it, but it's just hard to get people to change their ways. But my dad was just an avid, um, it was important for us to build up our ground. It was important for us to, you know, the land was something that we were, that was, that was, I guess, just a, something that we helped that we didn't just like take from. And I feel like that that is, um, farmers aren't the enemy with climate change. You know I mean? I think that they can actually be one of the biggest allies that climate change has if we can educate them to understand like, okay, that in a lot of ways this is better and there are, um, it's just a better way to go about it. One that I think about is whenever we feed our hay. Um, we have, we're on a rotational grazing system. It's just a more efficient way to graze. It keeps down your weeds. You know, it does a lot of other things like that. But, and I think that, um, you know, u- utilizing a lot of these conservation practices are just overall good for the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, because like we rotate our cattle through that. And then like in the winter time, we take all of ours and we typically try to put our hay on a hillside and roll it down the hill. And then it's double. I mean, some people will actually have like a concrete pad and they'll feed their cows and then they'll take the manure and then take a machine and spread it out. Well, we don't do that because we just, ours naturally do it. You know, we put it on a hillside and you run them down through there and then that, you know, that's where there's manure. And then the next day, the next time when you do it, you put it down another hill. And, and so you kind of spread out your own manure and then I'm not having to burn, use the tractor. I'm not having to burn fossil fuels. Right. I'm not having to do those kinds of things. And I, and we try to do that as much as, you know, and that's just one example of things. But I think that, um, and, I, and I definitely owe that to my dad. I mean, he was just, he was an avid conservationist. And that was just something that we have done, you know, for years. And there's no doubt that climate change has had an impact on what we do. Um, it's not even necessarily the heat. I would say it's the extremes like that we, I mean, I don't know that it's a lot hotter here than it was even like whenever I was a kid, but like we just have these stretches of heat. Um, so I think um, being much more keenly aware of like just that we can have wet years and dry years, you know what I mean? Like with the, with the changing patterns of that, I think that is one way that we have seen, you know, a really, really big um impact and the idea of global warming is that you just have more extremes mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that in general that it's going to be hotter it just means that overall you know what i mean the weather's that, just going to get real freaky yeah it, and it does get real freaky and i think we can even look at that whenever you notice just i mean the severity of storms mm-hmm. that we're having i mean whether it's um and it's not just like the like the atlantic hurricanes but i mean even just it seems as if like some of our snowstorms i mean again that when they hit certain parts are just I just feel like I'm always hearing about a record-breaking storm. I and mean, when you just look at that, we just do seem to be having a lot more extremes that just weren't plausible. And I, again, I know that that becomes very anecdotal. But on my farm, the way the road kind of comes in, there is an area, we, there used to be a creek, but this creek, I mean, and it's fed from a str- of spring probably eight or 10 miles away. And the creek used to run through here and then it just ran into a hole and it actually came out in the French Broad River. Mm-hmm. I mean, about five miles from my house through underground caves. The whole area is built with caves. Well, basically because of all these caves in this area, 
places have fallen out. And so the water doesn't even make it all the way to us most of the time. But in the wet seasons, it does. And once in a blue moon, um, there that water will get up. And we actually have, in the springtime on my farm, we have like a big five, about five or seven acre pond that just, you know, covers the whole little area. Well, um, it, for a while, it was about every 10 years, there would be an instance where we would get a special kind of a rain combination and the water would get up over the road. I mean, it's higher than the road sign. But um, whenever that water gets up over that, like the last time it was over at three weeks. One, and whenever you see that water getting up, because we have animals on different places, you have to be like, okay, you have to make sure you don't get them stuck somewhere, you know, where you can't get to them. Because I know that when that water gets up over the road, that time it was about three weeks. The law, I mean, in 94, it was up for like 49 days. Oh, wow. Um, which... You know, that's a long time to not be able to access that. And then not to mention, of course, it's in the spring. Of, that was in February. The one then happened in March, and then it was the end of April before it ever went down. But, you know, obviously the grass is going to be dead underneath there. Then you got all that debris that comes down through that you have to clean up. And then you have to make sure that it won't be damaging to the animals, that they won't get caught up. And, you know, I mean, all the things that go with that. I just think that it's important to to take care of the the, the environment and the earth just in general and try to leave it, you know, in better shape than it was before. My government name is Leonard J. Siebert, and uh, something about the trail, if you're on it long enough, you get a trail name, so I go by Crazy Wolf now. I was brought up as a military brat, so Fort Sill, Oklahoma is probably my key point. Uh, before then, I was in uh, Marlin, Texas, and I was probably about three or four, and I got to meet my real grandfather, and he was a full-blood Cherokee, very interesting guy. And he straightened my mind out in a lot of ways. But one of the things he said, you know, when you're out here, this is where you live. This is who you are. And I always worried he told me about Anglos and what they'd done to Native Americans. So I was angry. He's like, well, you don't understand something. It's not us that change the land. It's the land that changes us. We're seeing an awakening in uh, ecotourism, an awakening in uh, just wanting to be out in nature, to unplug from reality and come into reality because uh, you know, as much as we all use the internet, as much as we uh, rely on these technological efforts, it's a contrived reality. It's, it's something controlled by somebody. And they don't have our best interests at heart. Where nature is non-biased, nature is just there. And it's how you learn to live with it that either improves or can destroy you. I mean, going out in the woods ignorant is a dangerous thing. Uh, going out in the woods to learn, study, as long as you have a good guide, is a great thing. Because you learn things quickly but domino effect if you're not careful. I came out of D.C. pretty soured on humanity. I, uh, basically, I was hiking solo and I just wanted to be left alone. I mean, I got a lot of times, it'll be in a, come to a gap, somebody would offer me a ride, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm just gonna have a walk. But uh, slowly, you know, a couple of weeks into it, started having more conversations with people and uh, my attitude changed. It was kind of a revelation, it's like, what I was existing in D.C. had soured me on a false idea. This is how all people are, isn't true. Um, but I out in the woods, I found out people are a lot better. And they're just more open to conversation. They're more open to exploring their own humanity as it applies to a natural environment. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, sociologists all claim they have to cure to depression. 
I've actually seen nature cure depression easily, quickly, efficiently, no drugs. I think it's our own innate connection. I mean, uh, we can deny it all we want, but the reality is deep down, uh, homo sapiens, we're just an animal. We're, we're just afraid, scared, <laughs> uh, terrified animal existing in a cage. And once we get outside the cage and we see the woods, it's, I don't know, uplifting, freeing. But in nature, uh, it's kind of a second chance. It's like, okay, this is kind of where we belong. And yeah, I know we're not going to change the world. You, you can't change the world to be hunter-gatherers again. There's just not enough resources for that. But it would be nice if more people connected with it. While I, I, I don't deny Christianity or God, I'd, be, I'd lean more towards naturalism. In my view, when I'm out in the woods, I'm closer to creation than I'll ever be. I mean, comfort, comfort in nature is kind of an oxymoron. Uh, but inside my soul, I'm most comfortable, even if I, my body's uncomfortable. It just, like I say, I, I'm closer to creation than anywhere else I'm at. It's almost a Zen moment for me. Uh, it's, uh, you know, people always tell me, oh, don't you go to church on Sundays? And I go, no. Uh, at the time I was living in California and when I had this conversation and I said, I go out to the Redwoods to the highest cathedrals. My ceiling is the pine cones and the needles and a dappling light that comes through is better than any uh, painted uh, stained glass window I've ever seen. I, yeah, I, I'm impressed with the architecture of the ancient churches, but the reality is this is where that vision came from. At some point when we were hunter-gatherers, someone saw that vision. I want to copy that in an edifice as we became builders, creators, or sub-creators, actually. I think Tolkien had it right. We're not creators, we're sub-creators. The ancient uh, Native American tales are, there is no evil in the woods except what you take with you. There's the problem. Inherently, we take a lot of baggage in with us and that causes our fears, that causes our state of unrest. Uh, the woods is non-biased, it doesn't care. It's like the universe, it doesn't care. So we have to understand that, and that is an awesome, awesome realization, it's an epiphany beyond what most people will ever reach. It's, it's difficult to say, it's okay to be out here, it's okay to be afraid. Now, why am I afraid? Analyze why I'm afraid. Oh, this is because of this, I heard this, is it true? Well, no, because I'm out here in the woods and no bad monsters are coming for me. You know, it's, it's something, it's like folklore kind of destroys. It's a good thing, we need the folklore, we need to have those warnings. But to some extent, we've uh, got in our minds that it's real. So when we go in the woods alone, it's a frightening aspect. But anywhere I go, I'm just much happier in a completely, uh, natural environment it's uh you know i don't know how many people sit and just listen to a stream and listen to the music the rhythms uh the repeating songs i know it's big people put the mp3 players on their head and jam through and hike and that's great if that works for you go for it me i, I want to hear the song of the woods and it is a song it's a rhythm it's its own music if you will uh you know you can compare compare it to like uh, mozart's uh themes, his, his wonderful concert, concertos, but the reality is it's something that's never heard again, and you hear it, and that's it. You know, there's always a unique rhythm to it, it's always a unique sound, and you'll never hear the same song in the woods or in the forest or anywhere, even in the desert. You'll never hear that same song twice. So it's an experience that you, I would love everyone to try to at least try it once. You know, because I think there's a message in that song. I think uh, just like uh, we use, uh, le uh, what is it, uh, electro, uh, got a, what kind of uh, telescopes are you using now? Um, James Webb. We're trying to get a picture, we're trying to get sounds. The reality is the universe has a special music going on all the time. And it's never the same twice. And that's the important part, ever mutable, ever changeable. That's the fabric of the universe, that's the fabric of nature. It's always going to be changed. It's always going to evolve. What's evolving to you, I don't know. But I sure would rather be a part of it than deny myself it. And we tend to do that when we live in a, a civilized society, if it were. 
uh, we tend to forget. This is this evolution is ongoing. We're not part of it when we put ourselves in a little cubicle and plug in. I think we all have a part to play in this. Uh, uh, one of the phrases a friend used to talk to me is be a positive force in the universe. I mean, deep down we're less than grains of sand on a beach, but the reality of it is if we can each have that innate desire to just appreciate where we are, when we are. I, I think it's a fearful thing for most people because we all have desires that extend beyond our means, probably beyond our capacities. Uh, we have dreams. There's nothing wrong with dreams. There's nothing wrong with fantasies. There's nothing wrong with escapism. However, we need to ground ourselves in something. And you can either ground yourself in technology and the man-made concepts, or you can ground yourself in what you actually evolved from. And sometimes it's the older, uh, the older ideas that are more important. Uh, it's nature's here. It's it's free. It's go out into it see it, experience it. You might find the song, you might hear the song that says, yeah, this is where I need to be. I just, I have nowhere else I need to be. I think here and, here and now is a good place. My name is Merritt Moore. We're located here and we live here in Jonesboro, Tennessee, in the northeast tip of the state. It's the Appalachian end of the state and we are in the valley though. We're in the, in the Tennessee Valley. So we're surrounded by mountains but not in the mountains. So I grew up here and I left at 18 years of age to go to college and I was gone for almost 40 years. I had no idea when I got back here that I would fall in love with insects so completely. And one, one piece of growing up here that is related, oddly, is snow. When I grew up, we had seasonal snows, beautiful soft falling, just the kind of snow that would accumulate maybe four to five inches, enough to play in and sled in and, and have a magic, magical transformation of the world. And I loved it. I just loved it. You know, you go out and you stick your tongue out and get that snow and we had snowball fights and we made snowmen and we sled it down a very, very steep hill that was probably a quarter mile straight down. And the parents would block off the end of the road so no cars would come up. And it was just a thrill. It was both 
the silence of the snow. After you have a, a snowfall that's natural and gentle and beautiful, you have the kind of silence that occurs after a piece of music, that sort of full appreciation of silence. So there's no more snow like that. The only snows we get now are from a polar vortex, which are extreme snows and extreme and unnatural and untimely freezes. And we have warm Februaries. And that has really affected our ability to raise honeybees and to keep native bees alive. We do not take honey. We let the bees keep the honey. It helps them to overwinter. We do not open them and inspect them and smoke them. We want to allow them to protect themselves with a layer of, it's like rosin, called propolis. It is their protective envelope inside the hive. Whenever we open it up, and pull frames to see, oh, how's the brood doing? Or, you know, is the queen still here? Um, that disrupts them. So we let them be, and we have lost our hives. Um, in fact, in the last few years, Washington County as a whole had lost about 90% of, of beehive, its beehives. And that is a result of several things. When it is warm in February, the bees during the winter are supposed to stay clustered, stay together, and they vibrate to keep themselves warm. They need to keep a constant temperature. But when it's warm, say on a February morning, and they go out foraging because it's warm, and they look for food, but there is no food. Well, I would say we got here in August of 2014, and 2015 was a pivotal year. Not only did we deal with Steve's cancer and we started um, raising bees, but Francis Lamberts insisted that I become a part of um, the Northeast Tennessee chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. La Francis Lamberts is um, our Rachel Carson, who was the best known environmentalist um, in the United States, and she was responsible for the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Rachel Carson wrote books uh, back in the 60s. She influenced uh, Richard Nixon and, uh, to take action. She wrote Silent Spring. And so we at CCL created the Rachel Carson Award just so we could give it to Frances. Frances is a force of nature. She has created the Arboretum with 40 kinds of, um, you know, native trees and countless kinds of native plants. Her own property is a paradise of, uh, of nature, in my view. So it was Francis who insisted, and I could never say no to Francis, so even then, and so I got involved, but she wanted me to lobby the senator, and that was not my thing. I'm not a schmoozer, I'm not political, but that's what she wanted me to do, so I tried. But I just kept on going, and um, Citizens Climate Lobby I really love because it has become such a joyful community of action. Um, a global community like the Climate Stories Project, and a joyful one, supportive, informational. Um, so CCL has opened up to me um, just a wonderful, wonderful community of learning and action and, and whimsy, really, and fun.
My name is Dylan Henry. I am a uh, media and marketing director for a craft beer and liquor distribution company out of Tennessee. Uh, I'm working remotely now in Boston, Massachusetts. Morristown itself, uh, just in general, I would say it is an excellent town to be raised in. It's perfect for settling down in. Morristown itself is small enough that you can know enough members of the community to see your friends every day, you know, walking through the mall, go to the park, you of course know other people in your rival high school. But it's also big enough that you can go to the other side of town or you can go to these same spots that you're used to and um, still be surprised with what you can find. Yeah, the change in climate, the change in temperature and how nature interacted with Morristown, it hadn't really changed in recent years from my own perception, my own memory. Um, what I last remember is back whenever I was either four or five in uh, either 2000, 2001, or 2002. Um, back in those winters, we had extremely heavy snowfalls, at least for Morristown's, you know, understanding. You know, we were getting about a foot to a foot and a half, which, you know, up here in freezing cold Boston is hardly anything, but at least down in Tennessee, you know, that was a pretty big pretty big handful of snow and I just remember as a kid playing in these big snow heaps making giant snowmen um, it just being what felt like a winter wonderland and nowadays even thinking back that's a lot of snow for what I grew up with as I got older I remember not seeing hardly any snow at least in that measure so um, if I were to think off the top of my head we probably got you know half an inch to four inches of snow whenever I you know, was growing up in high school and in middle school. So I would say out of everything that's changed in the climate in Warstown, where we're down in the valley, definitely would have to be the snowfall. It's been really interesting because it's not necessarily the uh, foliage, because it's still temperate jungle. It's a lot of the same foliage that's out here in uh, Boston, but it's been just the harshness of the mountains that I miss. You know, when you're in Tennessee, especially in East Tennessee and Appalachia, um, it's easy to feel just almost like cradled by the mountains, especially growing up in Morristown where it's in a valley. You're completely surrounded by mountains on all sides and it's comforting in its own way to constantly have what feels like a bowl that you get to be in the bottom of. So um, I would say personally, it's been a big change of pace because I do like to, like I said earlier, whenever like to retreat off into the woods. It's nice to be able to be surrounded entirely by mountains and by trees where I feel like I'm alone, I have solace. I will say with the trees though, um, it's interesting too because there are a lot of the same or foliage, but there's a lot more pine. So in the winter time, it's really beautiful to see not just dead bones everywhere with the trees sticking up, you know, hibernating for the winter. It's good to see both pine trees too covered in snow so you get those harsh contrasts with green and white. Yeah, uh, just as you mentioned, my uh, second secondary job and one of my favorite pastimes is photography. I had originally started back when I was in, I would say high school, probably my junior or senior year. Um, I started with landscape photography, so of course that wraps up entirely with nature. And while I was going out and taking these photos, it was an excellent opportunity to get out and hike. Um, see how the world changes, not only through my lens, but through my own eyes, uh, in the rain, the snow, um, out on the lake, you know, heading off away from Morristown itself and into Middle Tennessee or deep into East Tennessee in the mountains. So photography has definitely been one of those things that's always gotten me outside. And that personal drive to get out in the world and travel, to see new sites that at least the people in small town Morristown hadn't seen, is really what got me into photography. So first it started off by going into Morristown, whether it was in uh, Cherokee Park, or I had special like certain spots under certain bridges, or uh, cliff side views that a lot of people didn't get to see that were special to me that I got to pick up with my photography and kind of put my own spin on it. And as that developed, um, I started getting more artistic with it to where I would whether through editing or just the camera angle in which it was shot, would do personal spins, whether they were long exposures, 
uh, kind of what I called cardboard cutouts to where the shadows would be so heavy you couldn't see anything else in the frame but exactly what I was wanting to point out. Mm. Uh, there was a photograph I took, I would say maybe 2018 or 2019, that um, it was a self-portrait of me at the bottom of just like, if I were to picture, imagine two stories of concrete rubble with an overhanging of fall trees, so you get the orange, the reds, and the greens. But what it was, was it was me hanging off of this dystopian, almost concrete uh, explosion in the middle of this forest, with nature draping down, both in front of my face, to the side, vines growing up this concrete wall, and it was able to show that even though humanity has taken over, and this humanity uh, in particular had decayed and was left to be taken over, you could show that the nature was creeping and crawling up into it. And I tried to, at least with the self-portrait, make myself fit that same feeling with rustic colors, uh, scraped up clothing, cut jeans. Um, but as far as the nature creeping in, I think uh, pairing the two together in a juxtaposition was one of my favorite photos. Um, I did the same thing with uh, a rainbow. So there was a rainbow over a abandoned, um, over an abandoned hospital, and it was really cool to see the uh, just the beauty of the natural world with kind of the mist and fog rolling in, with rubble, <laughs> shattered windows, rust like uh, rusted metal and broken brick. Um, all of that beauty and the rainfall uh, really added to some unique photos as far as nature is concerned. Yeah, I would say that there have been a lot of times where all I wanted to do was just run out into the woods and just spend the day to myself, <laughs> which doesn't get done near as much as it should. But I've definitely had days to where I will just hop in the car, drive out, and just retreat off into the woods. Now, it can either be up on a hillside, just walking down some winding trail that heads like alongside of a lake, or just deep into some unpaved path, or it can be just in the backyard, just sitting with my legs crossed with either a thing of tea or a beer and just letting the wind hit my face. If it's misting outside, not like a downpour of rain, but if the rain's lightly falling, I'll just go out and sit and just take it in, you know. I feel like lending yourself and lending your own conscious to nature itself kind of lets you feel like the chaos in your own life is not nearly as eventful as nature can be, you know. One thing that I feel like we're moving away from a lot as a society is um, we just kind of lose touch with what it's like to truly be outside. Recently, um, I went out with some friends to what feels like the middle of nowhere here, of course. Back in Tennessee, the middle of nowhere could be two hours in any direction and unless you're heading towards Knoxville or Johnson City, at least for Morristown's sake, you're going to be in the middle of the woods, in the middle of the mountains, literally in the middle of nowhere. We just drove 45 minutes outside the city, and to them, that was the middle of nowhere. There were lakes and trees and swamp, swampy marshes, and that was just entirely different to them. And it was really making me think that, as a society, we so easily get trapped in our comfortable zones, whether that be in our house, in our work, in our day-to-day -day lives that we forget to look back and soak up what our ancestors have lived in for you know thousands of years and before that just how the world naturally was for millions of years before that and I think everyone could do well with just taking time to go outside keep your eyes closed or leave them open and just soak in everything happening around you take time to listen to the wind Take time to feel the rain, feel the sun, feel the gloomy overcast clouds and how that reacts with your own emotions, and just let yourself feel as wild and chaotic as the outdoors can be.
Hi, I'm Wayne Lingerfelt of Churchill, Tennessee. I lived in, I was born in Kingsport, moved to Unicoi County when I was two year old. And uh, there I went to elementary school and went to Irwin High School for three years and to Chucky Doak High School for one year and graduated there and done some limited time at Tuscan College. The biggest thing that we had in Unicorn County, I guess, was just being in the environment, uh, uh, going to camp out almost every week. We ran in the mountains, uh, hunted, fished, and just about anything to have to do with the outdoors including farming with our families and everything. Seeing, seeing wildlife on a daily basis. Where I lived, I mean, it, it was there. We, we had everything. Or we thought we did until later years and, and things were starting to be stocked, you know, and, and uh, just like deer and turkey, uh, there was very few turkey to none in Unicoi County. Uh, deer, there was some deer there, and not a whole lot of that. But but it but it was a daily thing for the the smaller game, which we were very plentiful. It was very a memorable time. The I was hired uh, by the state, and uh, I met the supervisor at the office, and he put me with two officers. Uh, they had given me some uniforms. Uh, a gentleman in Unicoi had died, and so I got his uniform. And uh, they gave me a pistol, uh, no holster, no shells. I did get five shells for a six-shot gun, though. And uh, but uh, we worked that day on the post in the Holston River, North Holston River in Kingsport. And uh, I spent the whole day that day uh, picking the two gentlemen up that was in the boat. And they gave me a law book and told me to sit down under a shade tree and wait until I got to the next stop and read that law book that day. So that was my first day at work. Average work day, we were, it was a completely different world. I mean, we were almost 95% law enforcement when I went to work. And, uh, and everything, we, we were on call seven days a week, 24 hours a day our name and, and address was uh, put in every hunting guide printed in the state. So, I mean, I mean, you were, you were in the public, you was it. So, and it was just uh, from day to day, what, whatever we were called on doing. And in and, and the area I was up here, and when I started in was uh, 13 counties in East Tennessee. So we worked that, all of that, the officers, and I think we had uh, uh, 10 or 11 men for these 13 counties. This was quite an experience in itself. It, uh, the Holston River at that time was just loaded with big uh, snapper or mud turtles and uh, the soft shell turtles, well, and all the other sliders and all those kind too. And, uh, but the groups would come in every year and they would float the Holston River from Kingsport to Rogersville. And they, they had the boats, they would wade the water and, and they would uh, come to the banks where the, water, the banks overhung and they would go up under the banks and get those turtles out of there. If the turtle, if they were outside, you know, they would catch them. If they get under the bank, get back in what they call just a hollow back in the bank, they go in there and get them out with their hands. No gloves, just just by her head. But it, it was amazing just to watch it. And these people, I checked for their fishing license, which is what was required when when they came into the bank or a, a boat ramp. Then I was there to check them if I knew they was on the river. It's been a tremendous thing on the on the people that well on the area too. It's everything is building up it it's it, it's changing the environment it's changing the way people do things 
uh, hunting and fishing. Uh, fishing is is way down. Hunting is down by at least thirty percent. It's it is really hard to find people out at times. We still have several deer hunters and several turkey hunters, and this is the biggest thing in this area. Middle and West Tennessee's got tremendous amounts of ducks. We don't have those in East Tennessee. We have a few. There's a big change, big change in wildlife. In uh, East Tennessee, the bear population has really grown in the past 20 years. And it, and it is even more so probably the last 10. The deer is just unbelievable. We've got so many now and turkey the same way. We didn't even hardly have any turkey in East Tennessee. There's just so many things right now. Raccoons were, I mean, they were high priced and now they're almost a nuisance in town in places because there's so many of them and nothing to do with them. These, these bobcat are seeming like they are coming back here. They are uh, see more now than, than I've seen more in the past six or seven years than I've seen in my lifetime in a while. So that, I mean, they, they are coming back. The, uh, the biggest thing that noticeable that's not coming back, the grouse, the, the grouse that, that everybody used to, used to like to hunt grouse and you just don't, uh, they're just almost gone here. You can't even hardly find them anymore. The public and the, the environment, I, I think the biggest part of them, but you know, they they are trying to do their best. This is this is like the ones with the wildlife. You got some that wants it, you got some that don't want it. And this it's been this way ever since I I was working and, and it's gonna always be. You know, and it's uh this the same way with the other environmental things. They, they have changed. I think a lot of them have changed for the better, and, and they really have. And, but but some, it, some just don't care. They would go out and, and, and dump their oil or anything down a drain, or, and, and I'm not talking about companies here, just people. And, but I guess all we can do is just, just do the best that we can and hope for the others. The or the, the environment. I, I think you should just get out in your environment, spend the, every day you can outdoors, and, and just, just make the best of it. it it's, uh, you've got to get out and get in the woods and get in the streams and, and, and just enjoy it. You can't sit back and look at it and look at the pictures. They're wonderful. It's a wonderful thing to look at, but but it is, you just need to be there. You need to get out there where you can touch the stuff, the flowers, the trees, and, and you'd be amazed at how many thousands of things you've never even laid eye on. I've, I've, I've had a, some people I've introduced to the cucumber trees in East Tennessee in the past two or three years. Didn't even know we had any such thing. My place where my cabin is, I've, I've got cucumber trees everywhere there. And all you gotta do is pick up an Audubon book and look at it, and it'll show you where they're raised, where, where they're from, what they are, and everything about them. You may need to get back in the environment. It sounds like I do. <laughs> <laughs>
definitely grew up taking like a lot of walks with my dad like through woods like this so i don't really mind that it doesn't have like a crazy view uh, my name's anna mckay i'm from that's actually a great question <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, um, so my parents were Bible translators when I was growing up. So we um, lived on and off in Dallas, Texas, which was the base for where they worked. And then uh, we lived in Paraguay for five years and Papua New Guinea for two and a half. And then they moved back to central New York when we came back to the States uh, because my dad's uh, siblings lived there. So, And then uh, I went to school in central Pennsylvania for uh, sustainable agriculture and ended up down here about six years ago. I knew a lot of people who had like lived in the region and come to school here. Um, and so being in school in central Pennsylvania, when we graduated, a lot of people either went to like Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. And I kind of wanted to like try something a little bit different. So I came down here, lived just outside Asheville for a while and then moved to Johnson City about exactly six years ago. I was working on a flower farm in Blountville for about the first, I guess that was probably the first two and a half years that I lived here. Um, I worked with Aunt Lily's wild Wildflowers and we did a lot of weddings and like local workshops uh, and she grows almost all the flowers like on site. Uh, I, th I think there's something to be said for this area is the longest I've ever lived anywhere as an adult. Um, a lot of the places obviously that we moved to when I was younger, my connection to the environment was largely based off of like what my parents were connected to and doing um, and at this point uh, that's been a different experience as an adult. I do think that one of the reasons I've stayed here is because like Appalachia is such a unique like environmental region. You have like warmer and more like temperate winters, but you also are able to experience like full seasons because we're cushioned by the mountains in the way that we are. Um, I think that provides like a really unique, not only like living experience if you have like seasonal activities that you enjoy doing but also like a agricultural experience like we definitely experience a full dormant winter even though we're as far south as we are um you go down into georgia or somewhere like flatter and you immediately lose a lot of the like diversity that we like get here because of the mountains um so i really appreciate that like as someone who's considering staying here through like my adult years um it's the reason i've stayed here as long as i have uh i think there's just a lot of richness in environment and in culture that you is, is unique to Appalachia. I think if you grew up here, sometimes you take that for granted. Like my wife uh, was, has, was born and raised in this area, like in Johnson City. And I think that there is a sense of like wanting to get out sometimes, whether that's tied to uh, wanting to get away from some of the familial connections you have or uh, wanting to just start somewhere fresh. And for me, like that's kind of been like, a, uh, I really, enjoy this area because it is so different than like what I grew up with. Um, it gives you a lot of like opportunities that just aren't in other areas of the country. It's funny because I'll keep track of the weather like here versus where my parents are in New York and often during the summers we're within 10 degrees of each other like it's not like we get blistering hot here but our summers do stretch out a little bit longer so like our seasons would go from like April until like October, November is pretty like tolerable all year. Um, even earlier than that, sometimes like uh, March, like late March can start to warm up around here. But then our summers don't get like crazy hot because we are cushioned by the, the mountains. So um, sometimes I'll talk to my mom and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's only, it's not even 10 degrees warmer here. We just get our summers for eight months instead of three or like four. Uh, and I, I really appreciate that just as someone who likes to get outside and do things. Um, I know you can get into like winter sports and stuff like up north, but uh, from a growing season standpoint, like it's fantastic that you have like a full, like April to middle to end of October. Like we haven't experienced our full frost yet and we're into the second week of October. Um, so that that is like a unique part of this region. And because we don't have really harsh winters here, you can actually find farmers, like vegetable farmers who will grow through the winter in either like a, a cold house, um, which just means it doesn't like ever fully freeze in there or um, some sort of like heated greenhouse is pretty easy to maintain around here. So that's, I think where I find a little bit of personal frustration in this area is that it is so uniquely like positioned to sustain itself locally. But I think that's where the, um, maybe the like political infrastructure like isn't as well set up at the moment. I think we're moving in that direction um, with uh, like renewable energy being subsidized by the government at this point, um, things moving in that direction. This area though is like prime for like sustaining itself if, if we were able to like get that 
get that moving, I guess. Environmental protection like isn't necessarily built into the like infrastructure of the area. And so the people who I interacted with who cared about what was going on or were involved in nonprofits like that had kind of been like a grassroots like um, situation that they had built up rather than something that like everyone participates in because it's built into the like the the local like area. So like in New York, uh, you're not allowed to use plastic grocery bags in the grocery store. And that's just part of what it is. Whereas here, if you're going to use reusable bags, it's because you're choosing to. And that's I noticed that a lot. I also noticed um, people are really deeply tied to like their family roots around here. So like if you were born and raised here, there's a lot of like, yeah, we still get together every Sunday, like with our family. And my grandmother taught me how to can tomatoes and my grandpa, like my papa, like he, he has kept a garden for the last 60 years of his life. And that's always just been part of like my childhood, like going and visiting, visiting them and seeing that. And that's something that I feel like is pretty common amongst the people who live here. If you're, if you're transplanted to the area, like myself, like that, that family history like isn't as immediately rich. And so you kind of have to find those connections on your own. Like the flower farm that I worked on was like six generations of family had owned that 200 acres for, I mean, a long, long, long time. And so that the importance of like maintaining what the family cared about on that land and making sure that it was preserved and taken care of was a lot more personal than just like the young people I worked with up north who were leasing off of other people's land. And like, they sort of were a lot more like Anti-government might be a little bit too strong, but that idea that you're doing something that's against the grain, whereas here it's like participating in like local culture, I feel like. So I guess w one of the things I've noticed about like, so me saying that people will go to like a specific brewery because they know someone who works there or uh, they like knowing that they help make that business possible. There's a portion of that. I think other places that I've lived, there has been a sense of like almost like showiness to like the environmentalism so you buy local because then you can like say that you bought local whereas here i think people like to buy local because like i was saying earlier like they they care about who it is that's actually doing that <laughs> i've never i've actually never been here before i do know that they're not i don't think most of them are tagged but i think this is considered you have to have a certain uh, number of varieties of local plants in order to be considered an arboretum. And this is like considered to be like a local arboretum because of the variety of like plant life that's around here. Um, so that's like actually fairly noticeable just from walking around.